We ushered in the year 2020 with great expectations and plans to commemorate the 25th anniversary of the Visionary Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action, a blueprint plan with strategic actions to achieve equality, development, and peace for all women without exception. 2020 is a year where we're going to come together across the globe uh, as women in Africa and put together our political declaration and really spotlight the achievements that women have made uh, through this uh, groundbreaking declaration, but also uh, put a spotlight on some of the challenges of, that women still face and the need to accelerate implementation of the recommendations that were put forward and the statutes that are within the Beijing Declaration. 2020 was indeed the moment to take stock of what has been achieved and reflect on what has been the drawbacks in advancing gender equality and women's rights. At the same time, the Generation Equality Forums, convened by the UN Women and co-chaired by the governments of France and Mexico in partnership with the civil society, was viewed as a platform for scaling up urgent actions, coordinating, financing and mobilizing accountability for gender equality. But then, the COVID-19 pandemic happened. The pandemic has ravaged every sector, left the most vulnerable even more vulnerable, and deepened pre-existing inequalities, injustices, and discrimination that now threatens the generation equality goal of accelerating progress for gender equality by 2030. My name is Edita Diambo, and I'm a founder of Feminists for Peace, Rights and Justice Center. I work with women. My vision is to empower women, like political development, economical development, and social development. And when I talk about social development, I focus mainly on the voice, because uh, most of the time, the perpetrators use our voice to take advantage of women. And in Kebera, I ensure that I make women to learn how to say no. And when they mean no, everyone respect that no. I grew up in a very patriarchal community where it was a very retrogressive experience for women and girls where I come from. When I was six years old, I was raped. And when I come every day in this community, I see the house that I was raped in. It makes me to be more aggressive every day. And again, when I was 16 years old, I was gang raped and one of the gang rapers was uh, my neighbor was a neighbor and uh, one was a relative. And it was a very hard experience for me because later I realized I was pregnant and then I had to access and safe abortion just for me to survive as a young girl. So I didn't enjoy my teenage so much. And there was a lot of discrimination at that point because uh, the people who gang raped me came back in the community and started humiliating me. And it was a disappointment. I'm trying to solve uh, all violence against women but specifically, I will never want to see any girl or a woman experiencing sexual violence. COVID-19 really affected me, uh, just seeing how it has really hit the world and also the effect that it, uh, it has brought in women, especially women who have been living in poverty. It has been so difficult for women and for real, it really affected me uh, psychologically. Because every day when you work in the community as a young person, everyone has high expectation. When they see you, they see hope. And hope comes with a lot of expectation. Like yesterday, we didn't eat and they need food and they feel like you're the only one who can rescue them. So it was very, uh, a very hard experience for me and other women. And also it, uh, it brought fatigue in my body because since COVID started, we've never relented. We've never sat down and relaxed. You talk about sustainable development goals, you talk about gender equality, and I've been sharing with my women in Kebera, gender equality is very expensive. So if you're speaking about Beijing and, and still women in Kebera are living under extreme poverty, then what are we waiting for? If women are still violated today, if women in business, economic space are still violated, where is our hope as women? If all these declarations are never implemented, 
and yet we want independent women, we want educated women, we want an enabling uh, world for women. So what else do we need? Women are really tired of waiting and women want all these policies, declarations and bills to be implemented right away. I'm a sex worker by profession. Yes, that's what I do for a living. Apparently, I'm a mother of many because I've adopted some, like seven kids who their mothers used to be sex workers and they were murdered. So I'm the one who take care of them. My life was uh, very difficult. I'm an orphan and I was raised by guardians from this home to this home, this aunt to this uncle. And I didn't get that proper care. So, due to lack of many things, even lack of school fees, I had to move out and make my life now. That's when I ended there. But I don't regret because me being a sex worker, I can provide for my kids and I can provide for others. I came to realize that sex work is work like any other job. And despite being a sex worker, I'm a responsible parent to many kids. And also, I believe I help others even in that industry, who are not empowered, who have no information. When I'm there, I feel comfortable because of dealing with them, even making them feel comfortable when they're with me. Challenges are very high. First of all, we have no security, uh, even from the police when you Even from the places that you will, we, we are living, you have, we have no security. Matu says, kose kwa piloti, mitani, barabarani. You have nowhere to go to report. E-COVID is to Maliza everything, like everything. Ujue, job yetu ni a night. Hakuna club, hakuna hotel. Where do you expect to be protected your kula? Tuko mtaani. Wadu na ume wenye tunakutana ganazo kwezo vilabu wako mahomu. So ato umu sii, watana na ee, inakuwa. Sisi COVID imetu affect kabisa. Kabisa kabisa kama kuna watu, kuna sekta imi affectika, sex work imi affectika kabisa. Many of the sex workers say they are not sure they will be able to get the money back. Many of the sex workers say they are not sure they will be able to get the money back. Many of the sex workers say they are not sure they will be able to Nikakaa miaka 20 na bwana bahati mbaya yule bwana tukaa achana kwa makosa ya kinyumbani. Nikabaki na watoto. Watoto wale nimewalea kwa nguvu zangu, kufulia kufulia watu, kosha watu vyombo, kazi zozote zile ambazo napata riziki kwa njia nzuri. Kifupi mimi nimezaliwa kwa nyumba ya Wakristo. Lakini venye nilivyokuwa nimeolewa mume wangu akawa Muislamu nikajaliwa kupata mume Kiislamu sasa singe singependa niwe na dini mbili katika nyumba yetu ile ndio nikaamua kuislimu kwa ajili ya mume wangu alikuwa ko ni Muislamu sasa tangu ni Muislamu hii dini ya Kiislamu kwa kusema neno la ukweli imenijaza ndani ya moyo wangu hata nafsi yangu kwa ufupi najisikia niko sawa najisikia hii dini imeningia mpaka ndani ya moyo wangu Yaani na marafiki wangu wengi ni wale wa Kiislamu. Corona hii ya COVID-19 kusema neno la kweli imenipatia changamoto kubwa. Kwa sababu vibarua vile venye nilikuwa kwa nikifulia watu ambao mabwana zao walikuwa kwa kwa nje wanaletwa mapesa kupitia kwa mandege, wakawa sasa wenyewe wamesafiri wako hapa wanajifulia wenyewe mimi sipati kibarua. Kwa hivyo hiyo ni changamoto moja yapo. Alafu sasa ukiwa we unhujui mfanyaji kazi yule utamlipa nini takubidi wewe tajiri ufanye mwenyewe mimi fanyi kazi nikija sipati chochote hiyo ni changamoto moja yapo kwa kusema neno la ukweli hii covid 19 kikwangu mimi imenipatia stress yenye sijawahi kuona lakini Mwenyezi Mungu yuko mimi husema kila kitu kinachopangwa na Mwenyezi Mungu mwanadamu haezi kukivunja Mimi naitwa Christine Nabwire. Na niko na watoto sita 
na mjukuu mmoja. Alafu nilikuwa na mzee tukaachana. Nilikuwa nafanya kwa maua. Alafu ile corona ilikuja tukasimamishwa. Kwa sahihi na kazi. Napitia changamoto ngumu. Niko na watoto. Wanastahili wana wakule, wakunywe. Sa zingine kibarua kama sijapata wanalala nja. Na changamoto ya kulipa nyumba rent. Pia iko hapo hivyo. Ninafinyika kama mama mzazi nasikia tumbo ikikatika watoto wakilala nja. Hii corona imefanya nikafikiria mambo mingi lakini sasa inabidi tu nichipe roho juu na watoto. Ninasema Mungu anipe nile hao watoto nisiwawache kwa kuteseka. Lakini inakuwa ngumu. Inakuwa ngumu. My name is Tessia King. I'm 13 years old and I'm in Form 1. My favorite subject is history because it mainly teaches us about the about the origin of humankind. I like writing, traveling and also playing soccer. I'd like to be a journalist because journalist works is to write write things that they have experienced and they have they have they have been there when these things are happening and they write them down so that they cannot be forgotten. What makes me happy is seeing other people not suffering and and they are living comfortable lives. COVID-19 has affected my schooling because when when I was still in school, all the time you had, you had the time for reading. But now as you are at home, there is no cool place like a, a suitable environment for you to study in because everywhere there is noise in the neighborhood they're trying to listen to music like for example the music that is coming on from the neighborhood uh, so you can't read comfortably the government said that you can follow the the lessons through the television and most people may have the television but they have no electricity and some of them may do not have this electricity and they do not uh, even have the the television so you may find that even if you have that your test book and your exercise book these are limited resources mm -hmm. My name is Mary Liz Biubwa. I am a human rights defender, an activist. I'm a queer woman. I run an initiative called Be Kind Initiative. It's my own initiative I started in 2016. It's a mentorship program for girls across the country. So pretty much we, we pick on schools that have students that come from very, you know, vulnerable communities. Vulnerability here could be levels of poverty, it could be uh, girls that have experienced any kind of uh, sexual and gender-based violence, girls who have, have been in like early marriages and uh, have had children at a very young age and everything. But under it, I run a project called uh, the Fesson Project. It's for people in the LGBTQ community. So the idea behind the Fesson Project is to put a face to the LGBTQ community. Most of the time when you say, I'm queer, people ask, where do you get to be queer? We don't get to see queer people. And, and there's many of us out here, many of us don't have the privilege to live an out life. And it's not because we need to come out, it's because we live in a society that is very linear. If someone is heterosexual, nobody needs to ask questions because the assumption is everyone is heterosexual. I came out to my family and all of them were like, you know, my mom was very categorical when she said I didn't give birth to a child like this I'm a last born I have five siblings ahead of me so she was like 
something must be wrong because I mean I have five children ahead of you and I didn't give birth to this and she called me a thing I remember and she was like I didn't give birth to this and you have to leave my house and I don't want to see you it's been two years and yeah I think she's just doing her life everyone else is doing their life and how COVID has affected me is that during that period I was planning to move when we moved to this place Right from the first day we moved, like an hour into moving, we started experiencing a lot of homophobia. Apparently the neighbors in the area we were staying in, they didn't want to stay around people who are gay. I think the eviction has been one of the things that, yeah, the worst experience about COVID. I wouldn't compare how COVID has affected people to how the eviction affected me, because I felt, I felt, I felt powerless. My name is Amisa Zadia, the CEO of Coast Association for Persons Living with Disabilities. I'm also running a campaign called Jamie Kwanza. Jamie Kwanza, it means community first. When I was growing up, I had so many challenges uh, because I had the polio. The effects of polio resulted to me being a physically challenged person. I had so many challenges uh, throughout my life. I decided uh, to become a voice of the women, especially the voice of women with disabilities. Uh, this year only, I have gotten uh, to be named as a challenge ambassador on Urban Link Africa, and uh, I'm change ambassador for the changes I do on, in the community. Um, also a peace ambassador, because um, I do peace uh, issues, especially when we have conflicts, and especially right now we have issues of gender-based violence, parenting, and people have a lot of conflicts, and I won an international award for peace and security 2014. When we were told about COVID and we were told the don'ts of COVID, don't touch, don't do this, don't do that. All uh, the don'ts of COVID are the do's of uh, persons living with disabilities. The visually impaired have to touch, have to get someone to touch, have to touch so that they get the feeling this is where I am and uh, this is where I want to go. They need to touch. They need even to touch people, to have guides. So when you say don't touch, it's like you're telling them, don't leave. I sat down and I thought many of us are suffering. So that's why I talked to partners. I talked to friends. And uh, I talked, I had an, a one-on-one -on -one discussion with so many friends, including Femnet. So we did the supply of uh, fresh water, uh, clean water. We did the, the supply of uh, sanitary towels to the women who were just at home, to the girls with disabilities who were at home. We also had sanitizers, we had masks, and we had foodstuffs. And we made sure we have reached as many destitute cases of persons living with disability as possible, especially women. Hearing impaired cannot raise their voice, but they can leap. So when you're saying everything, you leap. So leaping with this mask, when we are told about this mask, then you cannot see my lip. So leaping read, it means this place had to be transparent. I would urge everyone to look at persons living with disabilities, the ability, the abilities they have, not the disability they have, because if we count the disabilities, each one of us have their own disabilities. My name is Dr. Wala Elizabeth. I work for Aga Khan Foundation as the Global Advisor for Health and Nutrition. 
I'm a medical doctor by training, uh, but I'm not in clinical practice for a while. That's like 15 years or so. I am more in the global health space as a health advocate. A new graduate of medicine and plugged into medical politics, as they call it, our association. And I used, I was often the only lady, um, of course, also the youngest in the boardroom. And one of the things that was expected of me was to serve tea and to pray and to take notes. <laughs> so um, this was very challenging. One, because I didn't see why should I have that role. So there are times I would refuse or there are times I'd just ignore. So I got COVID-19 in July of this year. I think the way we approached it as a country was to drive a lot of fear. And I remember every day um, the minister or the counterparts of the Ministry of Health giving out statistics on the number of people who have contracted it, the number of people who've died, uh, issuing dire warning, um, people being ferried in, in, in with guys in those hazmat suits, uh, neighbors reporting on each other. There was a lot of fear and stigma attached um, when someone uh, contracted the disease. And for me, that was um, quite a stretch on my mental anguish, being an extrovert. It meant staying in my room for almost two weeks, not interacting with people, uh, not seeing my children, and uh, being nursed by my nanny, whom I'm very grateful for because she risked her life to take care of me. Testing positive for COVID-19 should not be a death sentence. Over 95% of people uh, don't have symptoms or have very mild symptoms. So it's just about how do you take care of those around you in order to protect them from also contracting the same. Um, my name is Luciana Nyawera. I'm in PR and Communications and I'm interning for L'Oreal East Africa. My most closest family is my grandma. My mom got pregnant with me when she was really young, like 14 years old young. So she couldn't take care of me. So when she gave birth, she had to go back to school in like another place, my aunt's place. So I was left with my grandma. I feel like she wasn't really proud of me. So we never came to know each other as mom and daughter. Understanding my skin and what I should and shouldn't do as a young girl, that was a little bit complicated. I think people with albinism are viewed as sort of second class humans. So not very many people think they are normal people and they can do normal things. So many people, other people think that people with albinism are just there for handouts and they cannot achieve much. So when looking for work, it's a little hard. When I was growing up, I really, really wanted to be a cabin crew. So when I turned 21, I went to interview for that. <laughs> so I went through the first round, the second round, the third round. And then when we were called for medical test, the doctor just up front told me there is no need for him to do a, a medical test for me. because I could never be cabin crew. <laughs> so he said, you can, you can do customer service. <laughs> for me, COVID-19 has been a positive for me. As much as I'm not having so many side hustles, but I have social anxiety and having to work from my house has been a real blessing for me because I'm, I'm seeing myself having more done uh, compared to when I had to go to the office. What gives me hope is that we have women across the divide. We have women who are putting themselves out there, women who are standing up for their rights. We have women who are mentoring other women you know, who are emerging. We also have women who are standing in solidarity to say, if something happens to a woman in Nigeria, I 
even if I'm in Kenya, I'm in Uganda, wherever I am, I will stand with that woman because what is happening to another African woman is also something that I should be fighting for. So that gives me hope. There is no better time than now for African women's voices to be heard. These are stories of resilience, stories of hope, and stories for a just recovery to proceed a new generation to carry the torch and rekindle the 25-year Beijing flame into the new generation, a generation of equality. If COVID-19 is not addressed um, in the right manner using just policies, we are going to see an entrenchment of inequalities and we are going to see a very prolonged recovery process. So in terms of um, what needs to be done, we need to promote uh, and fulfill the human rights principles and the gender equality uh, principles which have been put forward in the different frameworks and different standards. We need to uphold gender equality just as a basic and also make sure that in addressing um, COVID-19, we also look at the different um, intersectionalities, the different lived realities, the different um, experiences of different women and girls uh, and societies as a whole. So when we are talking about a just COVID recovery, we want a recovery that really looks into all these issues holistically. There has to be a just recovery, a just recovery that upholds the human rights principles, a just recovery um, that does not discriminate, but a recovery that is also transparent in terms of the utilization of the resources. And a just recovery that gives hope to say, we need hope, uh, we need a resilient uh, economy and a resilient recovery of COVID-19.